8, 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the mis- misdeeds of the body, you will live. I'll um, just pray uh, before we start. Father God, please speak to us now. Please speak to us by your Holy Spirit as we see the word Christ in your word, the Bible. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Great. Um, we live in a debt-laden society. Um, debt is everywhere. Uh, and apparently the average amount of debt um, per household is 62 grand. Um, and apparently two grand of that is credit card debt. And credit card debt, an average APR, interest rate, would be um, 25%. So if you've got £2,000 worth of credit card debt, you're going to get £500 added to that every year if you don't pay off. And it's compound interest, so then the next 25% will be on top of that 2,500. We're heavily indebted. Um, and some of that, though, is, is benign debt. Like it's, it's not too bad. So a mortgage is, is you know, relatively manageable for a lot of people. Also student loans. Might be people here with student loans or mortgages. Um, a student loan is quite low interest rate. It's relatively friendly debt. But lots of debt isn't friendly. Credit card debt for interest. In, in the, for interest? I've got interest on the brain. Uh, for example, so if you've got a credit card debt, then it's going to hurt you in the long run. And credit card companies like to encourage that. It's very bad for people to be in credit card debt, but credit card companies will send around free credit cards and that encourage us to use money we don't have. And debts, they, they grow. That idea of compound interest, the amount you owe grows over time. And debts demand repayment. That's the way debts work. The whole point of a debt is it's something you owe. And if you are indebted, then you will get letters through the post telling you you have to pay, and that will grow, and that demand will grow, and lots of people end up in a, in a spiral of debt, kind of captured, trapped in debt. Um, and that can lead to real serious consequences, real-world con consequences. Like, apparently there are 50 possession orders a day. That's where people are told they need to leave the house they're living in, they're renting because they're behind on their payments. Um, two properties are repossessed every day in the UK. That's people having to leave the home that they own because they're behind on their payments. And there's individual debt we've been talking about, also national debt. So developing countries, um, that could well not be politically correct, I'm sorry, I don't know what the current um, right way of referring to poorer countries is. Um, but in the country, in the, in the world, there are poorer countries who owe vast sums of money to wealthy countries. And it is, it is iniquitous. It's deeply wrong. It's a, it's a residue of the colonial past where there are countries that, that owe huge sums of money beyond their capacity to pay. And that traps the country. They're, it's, it's oppressive. But... In our society here, debt is actually relatively relaxed compared to what it was in ancient times. So in ancient times, if you got in debt, you were in serious trouble. Because it was an agricultural society, your next payday is coming when the harvest comes in. And if you don't have any collateral, anything to offer in place of what you have, what will be taken as collateral will be, first of all, your clothes, your the stuff you need to work. In the Bible, it talks about people having their cloaks taken as a pledge. But ultimately, people paid their debt with their own freedom. They would be enslaved, literally enslaved, because they, they were indebted. And the reason I'm talking about this is because when we think, say, do wrong things, when we live selfishly, curved in on ourselves, it is really destructive. We've talked about sin already. That's what the Bible refers to as sin. And the Bible refers to the, the destructive effect of sin in different ways. And one of the metaphors, the images, the consequences of sin is, is that of debt. When we think, when we say, when we do wrong things, we will pay for it. But, but that isn't static. <laughs> wrong hardens into habits. And those grow. They develop interest. And they can control us and oppress us, trap us. And that kind of thing can happen gradually. You might not notice it. But we end up in debt. 
And Paul here is speaking to Christians. He's saying, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Um, and literally in, in Greek it's, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are debtors. But he says, we are not debtors to the flesh. It's not to the flesh. He's been talking a lot about flesh. And what Paul is saying is that um, you, brothers and sisters, you Christians, you are not under that kind of debt. You are free. And the, the good news of the gospel is that we can be free from that debt of sin. Um, we prayed earlier the Lord's Prayer, um, forgive us our sins. Again, there's two versions of that. There's the Matthew version and the Luke version. The Matthew version is actually forgive us our debts. And we pray that because we know that God has the power to forgive debts. He has paid it off. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid our debt. So if you're here this morning and you're aware of that burden of, of wrong, the moral debt, the spiritual debt, the, the, the sense that there's something you can't pay back, the message of the gospel is that Jesus can pay that. So turn to him, trust in him. That's good news. But Paul here is saying, he's not saying we're not debtors, actually. He's saying we're not debtors to the flesh. And the implication there is, actually, we are debtors to something, which is interesting, isn't it? And so what are we debtors to? Like, what's going on here? Um, Isn't that a bit scary? All all that we've been saying about debt and what it can do? Well, not all debt is crushing. Some debt is actually enabling. So, I think of the things that I do for fun, playing football, playing guitar. I think, wouldn't it be great to have a job that was just playing football? And people have that, don't they? They have the job of being a professional footballer. Um, And if that was my job, I would be paid. Um, Let's say I'm paid at the start of the month. And I'm paid at the start of the month, and then I owe football because I've been paid already. And I owe football to the football club that I'm in. But at the moment, I pay to play football. I pay every weekend, or not every weekend. Um, But I pay every week football. And some people are paid to do it. That's amazing. They owe it. They owe football to their club. But that's a delight for them. And they're not just paid. To, they're not just owing football that they enjoy doing, but also they're supported to do it. So a team of physios, a team of um, management, a team of coaching. Some debts are positive, or like think in relational terms. You know, if you are um, in a family, you kind of owe your family stuff, and sometimes that can be really annoying. But also, it's, it can be wonderful. Yeah, giving my family what they owe is actually a joy for me. It's wonderful. There's also a distinction, and this is all going to come together at some point, don't worry, um, between different kinds of debt. So if I give you a fiver, I lend it to you, then you owe me a fiver. If I give you a fiver to give to someone else, you're in debt, but to that other person, from me. that makes sense? So we can be in debt to someone who's given us something, but we can also be in debt to someone else from someone else. So there's different kinds of debt. And an example of this, both of these, is think of a kid getting pocket money every week, and they're getting money from their parents. And then when it's mum's birthday, the kid will buy a present for mummy out of the money that they've been given by mum and dad. That is paying back. It's not an an obligation, but it kind of is an obligation to buy presents. Um, And when their brother or sister has a birthday, they will owe them something, a birthday present, and they'll pay it from what their parents have given them again. So they're paying on to their brother or sister, and they're paying back to their mum or dad. 
And the reason I'm talking about this is because I want us to understand what it means, what Paul's saying here. He's saying we're debtors. What's he saying? It's like, I want you to imagine a room where you're living, a new door, just put a new door in a wall somewhere, and you open it, and inside, it's like a cave of treasure. Okay, look at that, cave of treasure. Gold coins on the floor, the carpet is gold, there's rare and wonderful things. Um, Can we have the next one? Yeah, why not? Another picture of a random treasure room. And the next one. Um, And I've put this next one on because I want you to think of this treasure room in where you live. And I want you to think of it not filled with like gold. I mean, I would love a room full of gold coins, don't get me wrong. But a treasure room for me, designed for me, would have really old, valuable books. It would have rare and beautiful guitars. It would have some really comfortable furniture in there. Um, it'd be... Yeah, do that for you. Make your own treasure room here. And I'm not just talking about a little room. Make it as large as... This can have annexes, yeah? And you can hear something in the background and like it's, it's a pickup truck pouring more gold into this treasure room, okay? It's a treasure complex. And as you walk around it, there's some stuff that's clearly for you. But there's some stuff with other people's names on. And you know it's not for you because you don't like it, right? I see a Manchester United shirt in my treasure room. I'm like, that's not for me. That's for someone else. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, some of it, there's also got stuff you can't really do on your own, like a board game. You can't play a board game on your own. It's boring. And you've got this massive... Tre- and you realise that actually... This stuff isn't just for you. It's you owe people those things. So I checked the label of the Manchester United football top, and it's got on it for Jay. So, all right, I need to give that to him. And actually, giving it to him is not like a, oh, man, I've got to... It is a bit, because it's Manchester United. Um, but also, it's like, I can see already he's going he's gonna to like it, he's going to smile a bit, and he'll be like, oh, thank you, John. It's going to be nice, Okay. I'm paying on something I've been given. Uh, oh, look, let's say the board game, something that needs to be shared. I'll come back to that. Actually. Let's say there's, there's some other things will be for specific people, but some stuff in there will be for specific times. So does anyone here still get letters? Occasionally? You might occasionally need to open a letter. Um, in your treasure room, we all have this, but you have an amazing diamond-encrusted, gold-plated letter opener. And you hardly ever have to use it, but you know when you do need to use it, you have the ultimate letter, letter opener. So some of it's specific, specific people. Some of it is for specific occasions. And being a debtor to God is having that treasure. It's having so much abundance poured out for us that we cannot begin to understand it. We cannot begin to explore it. It is vast. It's beyond what we can imagine. It's beyond what we can understand. What we have in Christ is enormous. It's life-changingly enormous. And it's not just for us. The treasure we have in Christ is for the world and for specific people in our lives that have been given to us that are matched to specific parts of the treasure we have in Christ. And some of that treasure is stuff that we owe back to God. Like, take the board game, right? I can't do that on my own. But it's something you do with someone. So it's like the person who gives you that treasure chest says, let's play sometime. You owe me a game. I don't know if you've had that with someone. You owe me a lunch or you owe me a game. That's what prayer time is. So, being debtors to God is about getting to know the treasure room the treasure annex, the treasure mansion, getting to know the people that God has put in our lives, 
getting to know the situations that God has put us in, and applying the right treasure to the right situation. That might sound a bit abstract. So let's take a specific example. The fruits of the Spirit are all treasure. Let's take one on patience. So, we owe people patience, right? It's an obligation. True. But it's also in the treasure room something we've been given on a vast scale in different ways. Think of the patience that God shows to us. Think of all the ways that you have been shown patience by God. All the times you've let him down. All the times you've let other people down. All the, all the times you've been infuriating, not just to God, but, but to other people. The amount of patience God shows us is vast. It is a treasure store. And then we think of the patience that we see in Jesus Christ. We see him on earth, really patient with the disciples, even with Judas who was going to betray him. And we get glimpses of that, but we only get half, well, a tenth, a fifth, a one percent of that story. The patience of Jesus Christ is enormous. It doesn't fit in our Bibles. And that's, that's our treasure. We have that. And that patience is extended to us daily. And it's shown to us daily in the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we owe people patience, which we do, when you're at work and that same person is winding you up, when, when your kids are still singing that same song, when you are still working in an A&E ward that is chronically understaffed and you are feeling desperate. In those situations, actually knowing that treasure and knowing the situation, that's life-changing. Because we, we have the resources and we need to, to get to know the patience of God. Experience it ourselves, see Jesus being patient, we need to see what the situation is, assess the situation as it is. Actually, what kind of patience does this need? What does patience look like here? Is this the kind of patience where I need to shut up? Or is this the patience where I need to keep on speaking? Is this the kind of patience where I need to be active and persevere? Or is this the kind of patience where I need to withdraw? Patience looks different in different circumstances. And we are given a treasure trove of patience. What are we, what are we going to do with it? And that's exciting, to get to know the patience we've got in, in God, that we see in Jesus, and, and to get to know the, the situation. And the people, right? Different people are going to require a different kind of patience. We are, we are debtors. And we must not hoard our treasure. Think of that vast palace one option is to do what I've been describing. Another option is to hoard it, to hold on to it, to, to grasp it, to, to not even go into the treasure room. It's there in that door in your house that you imagined. But you're not going to go in there because, you know, life's too busy. You haven't got time. It's, you know, I, 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 can, I can make do on my own anyway. Don't hoard your treasure. Go into that room, pick up the random stuff, and, and spend time in it and think, well, what's this for? Who's this for? What's the patience of God in Christ Jesus? Who's it for? How can I give it back? Where do I need to be patient with God in my life? Now, there might be times when it doesn't feel like treasure. When actually, I really don't want to be patient. When that's a grind. It, it is nevertheless treasure. And what will remind us of it being treasure is just treating it as treasure. Spending time with God, celebrating what he's done for us and praying it into what we've got ahead of us. A 
don't hoard your treasure. We've seen there's um, two kinds of debt uh, that can drive your life. Um, there's debt to the flesh and, and this, this kind of debt that we have. And in, in that passage uh, in Romans 8, actually if we could flick back to the passage, that'd be helpful. Um, Paul talks about life. He says, um, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. He's kind of got one image of being debtors. This other image is putting to death the misdeeds of the body by the Spirit. Putting to death the misdeeds of the body. Putting to death is pretty decisive, right? Um, Something's either alive or it's dead. It's, it's a decisive way of acting. And as we've already talked about, the, the Christian message is basically news. It's the news of what Jesus has already done. And the news of the gospel is that Jesus has confronted evil and triumphed over it by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. Jesus triumphed over evil. And he did that in a really surprising way. He didn't do it by brute force. He did it by giving his own life. He died on a cross, and that won a massive victory. And the Bible talks about this in different ways. It talks about Jesus paying our penalty, dying the death we should have died. It talks about Jesus paying our debts, paying a ransom. It also talks about Jesus conquering, conquering evil. And when we are tempted to misdeeds of the body... You know, using any part of our body, our mind, our hands, our eyes to, to do wrong things. We have the victory of Christ. We have the strength of Christ, the, the power of Christ. And we, by that, put to death the misdeed of the body. And that's an action, isn't it? So... You don't kill things accidentally. Well, you can actually, but, um, but you, you don't put things to death accidentally. It's, it's very deliberate. And this is called, um, the theological term for this is mortification of the flesh. And in the past, that's been, has been quite, you can, you can take it in quite a negative place. You can be quite masochistic about it, enjoying pain. Or you can have quite an ascetic kind of thinking of the body as like a bad thing. And the mortification of the flesh doesn't mean either of those things. It's a, it's a decisive and it's a radical repudiation of sin in, in the moment. And, and I've not put many things to death, um, but I've seen people do it on TV and in films, and what they do is there's a moment of decision, isn't there? Where they pull the trigger or they swing the sword, or they push a button, something, it's like a decisive moment in which you're willing the extermination of a person. That's pretty, pretty extreme, isn't it? And what this is, is us taking that kind of decision against wrongdoing. And this doesn't, come, um, this doesn't come in a vacuum. We do this in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate dragon slayer. His victory is our victory. And as we put sin to death, we do it in his wake. I want you to think of um, a dragon, and not like a good Chinese dragon, because Chinese dragons, I've learned relatively recently, they're nice. They're, they're lucky. They're benevolent. They're very powerful. But they use their powers for good often. In touch with water, apparently. Um, I'm thinking more Lord of the Rings type dragon. Um, so this is a village burning dragon, okay? Um, it's nasty. And Jesus Christ is the dragon slayer. He has is, he is, he is won a victory here. He has given this dragon a, a fatal blow. In Genesis terms, he's, he's struck it on the head. This dragon is dying. And 
as disciples of Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you follow Jesus this morning, you need to be a dragon slayer. You need to, to be up there with Jesus Christ, putting in the final touches. Because every time you are tempted to do something wrong, it's like there's a, this dying dragon is looking up at you and it's got its like puppy dog eyes or whatever the dragon equivalent of puppy dog eyes is. And it's saying, please don't hurt me. And it's saying, oh, just, just consider this. This won't be too hard. I, I, I'm on your side, really. It will flirt with you. It will reason with you. It will, it will draw out your pity. But if you're a disciple of Jesus, you need to be a dragon slayer. You cannot do anything other than, than slay that temptation. Because if you don't do that, if you don't drive the sword in, you're feeding it. And dragons in this, they're not Chinese dragons. They're not on your side. They're not fluffy. That will grow. And if you're not slaying it, you're feeding it. And it will grow and it will grow and it will get its claws into you and it will burn villages not just in your life, but in the lives of people that you care about. If, if we let sin grow, it's destructive. And so, in the moment, it's coming into you, you know, the, the, the temptation. Don't mess around. Putting things to death is decisive. In that moment, it's a, it's a radical repudiation. And it's in its death throes and, and we're slaying it, but it will come back. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll do this and you'll need to do it again and again. You'll, you'll stick the dagger in and then it will kind of rear its head. And, and it will appeal to you in different ways. The, the misdeeds of the body will sometimes reason with you, sometimes remind you of the, the fun times you had before. Sometimes it will say, oh, you know, this is harmless. Whatever it says... You just need to drive the dagger in. And there may be people here, I'm sure there are, who will have had fed specific misdeeds of the body over years. You've not been slaying, you've been feeding. And you can feel trapped in that situation. It can be a horrible situation to be in. And if you're there, then you need to know that in Jesus Christ, the victory is won, even if it doesn't feel like it now. That you still need to say no. And that we're, we're a team together. We're disciples together. So please talk to someone. There won't be any judgment because we're all in the same boat. We're all people who are living in the, in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who, who screw up and are deeply flawed and are sinners, but redeemed. So if this is striking a chord and you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm, I'm indebted and, I'm, and I'm, I've been feeding the dragon, please talk to someone. I'm happy to talk to you, talk to someone you know, but please don't leave here without having addressed that. Don't hoard your treasure and, and be a dragon slayer. And what Paul says is, if you do this, you'll live. The reason we're going to be slaying dragons and distributing treasure left, right and centre is because that's life. That's what the good life is. living in the treasure that Jesus has bought for us. Giving it back, giving it out, paying it back, paying it on. And that room is never going to be exhausted. And it's repeatedly <laughs> gritting your teeth and sticking the dagger in. In that is life. 
Thank you so much for joining us online this morning. We're really hoping and praying that God spoke to you through what you heard. We meet in Bristol City Centre and we'd love to meet you in person. So do come along. Um, we meet in Broadmead uh, and you can find the details of where we meet online. We're here as a church because we've been changed by the good news of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came and he lived and he died and he rose again. And that changes everything. It redeems us from our brokenness and empowers us to change, to live transformed lives. Lives of love, lives of hope, lives of faith. We would love to meet you and we'd love to get to know you. Um, so do come along in person. Um, and if you want to get in touch beforehand, uh, then do get in touch using our email address and on our website. Um, we'd love to get in touch with you, um, hear who you are, what you're about, and we'd love to pray for you as well. Thank you.